We will continue talking about Chapter 4, Money and Inflation, with Lecture Number 4, and in this lecture we'll cover money demand. To begin with, I want to try to relate what we've talked about so far, the quantity theory, uh, to this money demand relationship. Now what money man demand tries to do is figure out how much liquidity will be demanded by um, the um, economy given the relevant economic factors within the economy. So a very, and, and we've already said that the quantity theory is a very, very simplified approach to this relationship between money and the other macroeconomic variables that we're interested in. And it actually might be just a little too simple. So we're going to see that here if we look at, well, how can we get a money demand function out of this quantity theory? Well, if what we do is, first of all, I'm going to be a little unorthodox and say that we're going to skip a few steps uh, in, in this whole literature. I mean, we're not skipping steps now, but, but in the whole development of this literature and say that what we're really interested in in a money demand function is how much real balances people demand. Real balances is the money stock divided by price level or the total purchasing power represented by the current monetary portfolio. So think about it like this. Let's say I have $10,000 in the bank. Do I really care that I have $10,000 in the bank? Well, I guess in a way, yes, but not really. What I care about is what that $10,000 will allow me to buy. So if a loaf of bread costs a dollar, then I can buy 10,000 loaves of bread with that $10,000. But if a loaf of bread costs $10,000, well, I can only buy one loaf of bread. So obviously, what that price level is makes a difference in the purchasing power of that money that I have. So we're going to assume that we're interested in what's called real balances. Now, if we solve the equation of exchange for this real balances, we end up with m over p equals 1 over the velocity times real output. And in equilibrium, at least, we know that money demand has to equal this. All right, so in the very least, in equilibrium, we have this. All right, that money demand equals this, or the demand for real balances equals this um, function of the velocity and real income. So let's let's take a look at well, what does this imply. Well, first of all, it implies that as our income goes up, we're going to demand more money. Okay, well that makes that makes a fair amount of sense. It also implies that as velocity goes up, we're going to demand less money. So we can almost see an increase in velocity as a, as a decrease in money demand. And later we may try to interpret velocity in that way. So if we have a significant increase in velocity, what are we doing? We're wanting to hold less money. And so if this number of transactions stays the same, well then velocity has to go up. Okay, And then finally we see that money demand is going to respond positively to an increase in price. If price level goes up, well, we're going to demand more money. Now, do, do all of these implications make sense? Well, more income, we're going to want to conduct more transactions, we're going to more, buy more stuff, we're going to want more money. If we want, if price level goes up, will we need more money? Well, sure, we're going to need more nominal balances of money. If, if the price of a loaf of bread is one dollar, how, how much money do I need to buy a loaf of bread? One dollar. If it's ten thousand dollars, how much money do I need to buy a loaf of bread, $10,000. So th all these implications seem to make sense, and that gives us a nice interpretation of changes in velocity. So velocity goes up. Well, that means on average we want to hold less money. So that's a, a decrease in money demand. And if velocity goes down, on average we're willing to hold more money. So what does that mean? Well, that means money demand has gone up. Now, you might notice that, well, there's something a little weird about this particular money demand function. And that is, well, you know, there's, there's, well, there's something missing. There's no interest, right? No interest rate. Well, if there's no interest rate, what does that mean? There's no price of money. Because we can think of interest rate as a kind of price of money. And since there's no price of money, we've got a demand function that has no price. Well, 
that's a little weird. All right, if we remember back from chapter 3, we basically found that the demand for loanable funds, which is somewhat analogous in that model to what we're talking about here as far as demand for money, we had that money depended upon or the demand for loanable funds depended upon that real interest rate. And here we have no interest rate, so what do we do? All right, so that 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 leads us to say, well, maybe this model is a little too simple and we need to take a step forward. So, hence, we, we take a look at the work of John Maynard Keynes, who stepped, took a step back from the quantity theory and asked a very simple question. He said, why do individuals hold money? Well, there's three reasons. Number one, transactions. I want to buy stuff. I want to sell stuff. And I need money to facilitate those transactions. Without money, then what happens? Our economy reduces down to a barter economy. I have to trade, and I have to find someone who wants what I have and has what I want. With money, I don't have to worry about that. It facilitates transactions. Number two, a precautionary motive. All right, now, the easiest way to think about this is, well, what if I lose my job? Well, if I lose my job, then I'll lose my income. And if I lose my income, I won't be able to afford to buy food. If I can't buy food, I won't eat. If I don't eat, I'll starve to death. All right? This is a bad idea. This is a bad thing. So I'm worried about this. So what am I going to do? I'm going to put away some savings. Now, but, but you're saying, but I could invest that. Well, sure I could. Let's say I invest it in a, the stock market or I invest it in a bond or something. But those things have a long term on them. I may not be able to get my um, funds out of that immediately. They may not be what we call liquid, easily transformable into something else. So I want to keep some savings in fairly liquid assets, something like money, in order to protect myself against, you know, a rainy day, bad things happening. And then finally, there's a speculative motive. So there's an investment motive to holding money. Any portfolio is going to have a certain amount of cash in it. Why is that? Well, that's so they can take advantage of future opportunities. There are also maybe reasons, for example, um, speculating uh, by buying different currencies. There's numerous ways. Some monetary assets yield interest. There's numerous reasons why there would be an investment motive or speculative motive to holding money. Well, we see, first of all, we're going to stick with this idea of real balances. And so we're dividing that money stock over price level to find out what that purchasing power is so that we adjust for changes in prices. And we see that that's a function of interest rates. Why? Because interest rates will affect our precautionary motive. Let me ask you this. If I tell you that the interest you're going to earn on your assets are 0.0000001%, you might be willing to be pretty precautionary. You know what? I'm just going to keep a bunch of money. I'm not earning anything otherwise, right? Uh, but if I tell you, you know, your rate of return on this asset is going to be, you know, 45%, you know, reasonably safe asset. I know that's too good to be true, but you get the idea. You may not be quite so precautionary anymore, right? Um, so we have interest rates are involved, a speculative motive, that's that um, um, investment. So there's, there's interest rate involved there. And we have income involved. And that, that same motivation that comes in from the transactions motive, the higher income, the more transactions we want. And so we find that we have this money demand function that comes out of this, what we actually will refer to as this liquidity preference theory that is negatively related to the interest rate and positively related to income, which is exactly what we would expect. Another very interesting and very nice thing about this Keynesian liquidity preference theory is that in this theory, velocity doesn't have to be constant. So the procyclical movements of interest rates should induce procyclical movements in velocity. In other words, as the interest rate rises, the opportunity cost of holding money increases. And when that opportunity cost of holding money increases, we want to try to conserve how much money we hold. We want to hold less money so that we give up less 
interest. And what will that do? That will push velocity up. And when, likewise, when interest rates are low, we're willing to hold more money, which will push velocity um, down. So, and velocity will change as expectations about the future. Normal levels of interest rate changes, right? Expectations become a really important part of decision making. We haven't talked too much about that yet, so we're going to leave that alone for right now. Um, but we notice way back when we talked about velocity that velocity wasn't exactly constant. It didn't fluctuate a lot, but it wasn't constant. Well, the liquidity preference theory allows for that movement in velocity and and a movement that isn't simply tied to changes in the structure of the economy like the the um, uh, technology of money and such okay that concludes our talking about uh, money demand we will continue with the next lecture